If you're a fan of Studio Ghibli, then you've no doubt heard of Joe Hisashi, the man behind the music from all but one of Hayao Miyazaki's films. His Ghibli scores are iconic, and Miyazaki himself has admitted that Hisashi's contributions to his movies are a key part of their success. The relationship between the pair has been compared to that of Steven Spielberg and John Williams, who have worked together on some of the biggest Hollywood blockbusters of all time. However, while Hisashi is best known for his collaborations with Miyazaki, his musical journey began long before Studio Ghibli even existed. Hisashi's real name is Mamoru Fujisawa, and he was born in Nakano on the 6th of December 1950. His father was a high school chemistry teacher who wasn't really into music, but he owned an old gramophone that used bamboo needles, something that fascinated his son. With that, I listened to lots of music, regardless of the genre, the composer once said. He started taking violin lessons at the age of five, and he began dabbling with other instruments during his teenage years. My parents were not musicians, but in junior high school, I belonged to the brass band club, where I played the trumpet, trombone, saxophone, and even conducted as well. When he entered high school, Hisashi turned his attention to piano and set his sights on attending the Kunitachi College of Music in Tokyo. He was mainly into jazz at the time, but it was during these days that he discovered A Rainbow in Curved Air, the third album by American composer and minimalist pioneer Terry Riley. Its innovation shocked me and inspired me to explore minimal composers like Steve Reich, Philip Glass, and Arvo Pert. By the time Hisashi entered music college in 1969, he played several instruments and had influences from right across the musical sphere, though it was actually his father who unwittingly put him on the path to becoming a world-famous film composer. Dad wasn't really familiar with music, but he did love the cinema. He took me to the cinema to see hundreds of films. It was during these trips to the movies that Hisashi began to dream about scoring films, but he knew that he would have to start small. In 1974, he landed his very first anime gig, composing the music for the TV adaptation of Shunji Sonoyama's manga series Gia Torozu. Known in English as First Human Gyatris, or Gyatris the First Man, depending on where you look, it's a slapstick comedy that follows a caveman and his family as they go about their daily lives in the prehistoric world. Unlike the hit Hanna-Barbera cartoon The Flintstones, which mirrors modern society and has cavemen living alongside dinosaurs for some reason, Gyatris is true to its setting. Underneath all the wackiness is the simple idea that people back then had more humanity than modern humans, despite their comparatively modest existence. There are some surprisingly touching moments, and as such, the music needed to elicit a variety of emotions. It ranges from offbeat and a little quirky, <laughs> to nostalgic and melancholy. which are all traits that would come to define Hisashi's Studio Ghibli scores in the years to come. Hisashi went on to compose the music for the 1976 sci-fi comedy Roboco Beaton, known as Robot Child Beaton in the United States, where it was licensed by Viacom. It's a show about a kid whose uncle in America sends him the blueprint to build a robot, but the boy, who looks like Ash Ketchum wearing Mario's overalls, makes a mistake during the building process. The result is Beaton, a little yellow robot made of electrical scraps who's convinced that he's a real boy. He's basically Pinocchio if Geppetto decided to make him from a bunch of old household appliances rather than enchanted wood. The show is pretty much lost to history now, but it was quite a big deal at the time. 50 episodes were produced and there was a bunch of merch, including colouring books and a toy line. The toys are honestly a little bit creepy, but they're considered collector's items these days, with some going for hundreds of dollars at auction. Roboco Beaton was another chance for Hisashi to show what he could do, and again, there are early echoes of his Ghibli work here. The anime is aimed squarely at children, and the music reflects that, with the main theme composed using the same marching rhythm that Hisashi later used for My Neighbor Totoro and Ponyo. <laughs> When the 1980s rolled around, Hisashi made a big decision. He opted to change his name. Well, in a professional sense, at least. 
He stopped going by Mamoru Fujisawa and adopted the stage name that the world knows him by today. But why did he pick Joe Hisashi? The composer explained his choice during an interview with Crunchyroll. In the early 1980s, I wanted to establish myself as a commercial musician and artist. To do so, I needed a name that was easily recognisable to Western audiences. Quincy Jones has always been a musical inspiration to me, so I chose my name after him. Jones's name roughly translates as Joe Hisashi in kanji. It's easy to say why Hisashi has such respect for Quincy Jones, a man who's moved seamlessly between genres over the course of his decorated career. While he rose to prominence as a conductor and jazz arranger in the 1950s, Jones has also won plenty of plaudits for his work in the pop world. He's worked with everyone from Frank Sinatra to Michael Jackson, amassing an incredible 28 Grammys along the way. And, like Hisashi, he's well known for his film scores. Jones was the first African American to be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. With his new Quincy Jones inspired moniker in place, Hisashi set about establishing himself as a new force in Japan's music world. He composed the music for the anime Sasuga no Sarutobi, which had more of a city pop vibe. <laughs> he produced his first record, a minimalist masterpiece by the cult percussionist Midori Takada. Described as ageless and ethereal by Pitchfork and a holy grail album by the hilariously named We Release Whatever The Fuck We Want Records, the album was a real calling card for Hisashi. His unique talents were on full display, but despite his love for the genre, he didn't want to be pigeonholed as a minimalist musician. As such, his follow-up album, 1982's Information, was a far more mainstream affair, tapping into the new wave sound of the day. Together, these two records marked Hisashi as someone who was capable of creating music that was both awe-inspiring and catchy, and this is what caught the ear of Studio Ghibli co-founder Aisao Takahata. Hisashi has revealed that it was Takahata who recommended him to Miyazaki when he began working on 1984's Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Takahata and Miyazaki had known each other for many years at this point, having risen through the ranks of Toy together. The pair served as directors on the anime series Lupin III in the early 70s, a show about the grandson of Maurice Leblanc's famous gentleman thief Arsene Lupin, and this is what ultimately led to Miyazaki establishing himself as an up-and-coming talent in the anime world. Miyazaki took charge of his first film in 1979, the outrageously entertaining Lupin III, The Castle of Cagliostro, which of course features the same character. By the time Miyazaki was ready to direct his second film, he and Takahata were practically inseparable. That's why he trusted Takahata when he told him that Joe Hasashi was the right man to create the music for Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. <laughs> ま、世の中にこんなに純粋な人がいないんじゃないかと思うくらいにあの <laughs> the synth heavy score might seem a bit dated today, but it fits the post apocalyptic setting to perfection, and Hisashi's work here actually helped to define the sound of animated movies in Japan for years to come. What few people know is that Hisashi's daughter Mei, who was just four years old at the time, also contributed to the soundtrack, performing the song Nausicaa's Requiem. Speaking to the Sydney Morning Herald in 2019, she revealed that it was a daunting experience. My mother was with me because I was crying, because in the recording booth it's very, very tiny and dark. And then, you know, that scene was kind of sad. May went on to reveal that she didn't actually see the movie in its entirety until she was a little older, adding that the heavy themes were lost on her at the time. Nausicaa was very difficult for me. I couldn't understand what it was all about. Later on, I saw the film when I was 10 or something, and now I understood it. While technically not a Studio Ghibli film, the success of Nausicaa is what led to the founding of the iconic animation house, and it's often included in Ghibli box sets. 
The positive response to the movie gave Hisashi the confidence to found his own recording studio, which he named Wonder Station. One of the very first things that he made was the soundtrack for Miyazaki's next film, 1986's Laputa Castle in the Sky. The first official film released under the Ghibli banner, Laputa is more steampunk than fantasy, but it touches on many of the same themes as Nausicaa, environmentalism in particular. Another thing they have in common is a synth-heavy score from Hisashi, though you might be surprised to hear this if you've only ever seen the English dub of the film. In 1996, Disney struck a deal with Ghibli to become the new distributor of the studio's films in America, but executives in California apparently weren't keen on the music from Laputa. Speaking to Keyboard Magazine at the time, Hisashi explained what the issue was. According to Disney staff, foreigners feel uncomfortable if there is no music for more than three minutes. You see this in Western movies, which have music throughout. It is the natural state for a Western animated film to have music all the time. However, in the original Laputa, there is only one hour's worth of music in the two hour, four minute movie. There are parts that do not have any music for seven to eight minutes. So we decided to redo the music, as the existing soundtrack will not be suitable for the markets outside of Japan. If we just add new music, it won't go well with the music made 14 years ago, so we completely re-recorded everything. Of course, we cannot demolish the melody of Laputa, so I changed the arrangement of it while keeping its integrity. There are those who argue that the new score is slightly over the top in places and that it takes away from the contemplative nature of the film, especially in the third act. I agree with that 100%, but I also think that the dub score actually improves the film in places, with the chase scenes in particular just popping that little bit more. At the end of the day, both versions are great, and this just serves as another example of Hisashi being able to adapt his approach while still being brilliant, which brings us to the next phase of his career. Toward the end of the 1980s, Hisashi founded his own label and released a new record named Pretender, his first true solo album. Pitchfork said that the record proved that Hisashi could do a solid Kenny Loggins impression, which I'm guessing was meant as a compliment? I hope so, because honestly, Pretender is a great album. Meet Me Tonight is an absolute banger and the cover art is ridiculously cool. This marked yet another new direction for Hisashi, and he was determined to keep trying new things in the years that followed. When the 90s rolled around, Hisashi ventured into the realm of video games for the first time. He agreed to create the music for the PC game Far East of Eden 2, which was the most expensive video game ever made at the time. If you love Hisashi's work and you've got a soft spot for 8-bit music, then you have to get your hands on this game. It's an RPG set in a fictional country where members of the Roots Clan and the Fire Clan have been at war for centuries. You play as a character called Manjimaru Sengoku, a purple-haired teenager from the Fire Clan who sets out to save the world from the Roots Clan after they destroy his hometown. The music is dramatic when it needs to be, but it's pretty relaxing on the whole, and honestly, it's crying out for a low five remix. Hisashi also started branching out with his film score work around this time, forming a relationship with a new director, Takeshi Katano. Katano was a comedian by trade, and he was best known for the cult game show Takeshi's Castle at the time, but he flipped the script with his directorial debut Violent Cop and his critically acclaimed follow-up Boiling Point. Both films deal with the Yakuza and the intricacies of organised crime in Japan, a topic that quickly became Katano's calling card. However, in a move that surprised a lot of people at the time, he went in a totally different direction for his third film, a romantic drama named A Scene at the Sea. Released in 1991, A Scene at the Sea is a meandering movie about a deaf garbage collector who decides to take up surfing after finding a discarded surfboard. It's a touching tale made all the more memorable by Joe Hasashi's delicate score, the first of many that he did for Katano. Perhaps the most memorable of the bunch is the one he made for 1993's Sonatine, which follows an aging Yakuza who gets double-crossed by his boss. This was Katano's breakout film on the international stage, and Hisashi's unsettling, nihilistic soundtrack was a big part of that success, informing the sound of many other later Katano films. It was during this period that Hisashi decided to take a stab at directing himself with the movie Quartet. 
making him the first Japanese film composer to direct his own feature. Released in 2001, the film follows four musicians who reunite after years apart to enter a prestigious competition. They drifted apart after attending college together, but a chance meeting at an audition for a Tokyo orchestra brings them back into each other's lives. On paper, it's a pretty basic relationship drama, though Hisashi's music makes it stand out from other films of this type. In a largely positive review of the film, Variety said, Above all, Quartet is a pick suffused with music and the love of playing it, and Hisashi has come up with a score that's inspirational and invigorating by turns. One magical moment during the group's summer tour catches the communicative joy of music that only a composer could convey. It's a point where Hisashi the director meets Hisashi the movie composer. The following year, Hisashi reunited with Katano for the film Dolls, which would turn out to be their final collaboration. It does feature his typical aging Yakuza character, but it's not a crime thriller. It follows three separate men, all with a distinct but equally tragic story. It's a highly stylized film about love and death, and the exquisite music from Hisashi once again elevates it. In fact, some people believe that this is the best score of the composer's career. But the music of Dolls is apparently why Hisashi and Katano's relationship came to an end. While Katano has stated that Hisashi simply became too expensive at this point, there's a long-standing rumour that the two had a big falling out when some of the music Hisashi turned in wasn't used in the final cut. They also apparently clashed over where and how the various tracks should be used in the film, something Hisashi believes is hugely important. In a recent interview, he said, the order of the songs affects the meaning of each piece, which is to say that each piece can take on a different meaning depending on how they're ordered. It's also been said that Hasashi just didn't like the screenplay for Dolls, which only added to the friction. The ensuing arguments apparently led to a breakdown in their friendship and brought about the end of their fruitful working relationship, which perhaps explains why Hasashi has always kept things professional between himself and Miyazaki. Speaking in 2023, Hisashi said, I think the secret to a long-lasting professional relationship is not having too much of a personal relationship. Me and Hayao don't go out to eat or drink together. We're strictly professional. Now, this may come as a surprise to those who love Hisashi's Ghibli scores, but don't let it give you the wrong idea. It's not that they aren't friends. In fact, Hisashi was visibly moved when Miyazaki surprised him with a bouquet of flowers at the end of one of his Studio Ghibli concerts. They've also given each other some pretty special birthday gifts over the years. Hisashi has revealed that Miyazaki sometimes sends him a personalised sketch on his birthday, and the composer once made his longtime collaborator a bespoke piano piece to celebrate his big day. What's interesting is that this piece of music eventually evolved into Ask Me Why, the main theme from The Boy and the Heron. In this sense, Miyazaki's latest and potentially last film is the most personal collaboration between the two men to date. At this point, Miyazaki has complete faith in Hisashi's ability to bring his work to life in just the right way, which is why he decided to approach things a little differently this time around. By the time he began work on The Boy and the Heron, Miyazaki trusted Hisashi completely, and he decided that the composer didn't need to be briefed on the story. In fact, Hisashi didn't even get a glimpse of the film until it was almost finished. Miyazaki showed him a near-complete version and simply told him, I leave it all up to you. Of course, that would be enough to send most composers into panic mode, but Hisashi has said that he understands why Miyazaki didn't share the storyboards with him. Speaking to Variety, he said, it was a very different approach from our previous collaborations. He wanted me to watch the movie with no prior knowledge or bias or judgement. The result of this approach was a film score that can only be described as classic Hisashi. His piano piece Ask Me Why, the main theme of The Boy and the Heron, blends nostalgia and optimism in a way that only he can, and the score at large takes a minimalist approach. It's almost as though Hisashi was inspired to return to his roots after seeing Miyazaki do the same with his film. Like the film's main character, Mahito, Miyazaki was a child during World War II, and he also had to flee to the countryside to avoid the bombs. The boy in the heron clearly draws on his past experiences, and Hisashi knew that a more delicate approach would better serve the story. I decided right at the start that it would probably not be good to have a full orchestra playing the whole time and that I would play the piano. It would be a chance for me to move myself close to what Miyazaki had intended. This less is more approach to scoring films has become one of Hisashi's signatures over the years, and it's part of why he's such a sought-after composer, and not just by Miyazaki. 
in 2020, Hisashi did the score for the Chinese fantasy movie Soul Snatcher, and the year before that, he created the music for the anime Children of the Sea, a film about a girl who gets pulled into an adventure involving all the world's ocean life after meeting two mysterious brothers at her father's aquarium. According to director Ayumo Watanabe, securing Hisashi's services was his top priority. He's understandably a big admirer of the composer's work, so he had a bit of a fanboy moment when Hisashi agreed to take part. But his excitement soon turned to amazement as he watched his hero at work. So, Hisashi has been a man in high demand for decades at this point, but he seems to have reached a new level of fame over the past few years, especially in the West. He actually made history with his score for The Boy in the Heron, which was nominated for a Golden Globe in 2024, the first time a Japanese animated film had been nominated in that category. The news came as a pleasant surprise to the composer, who only found out about his nomination when an American friend called to congratulate him. I had no idea that I would be nominated, because this is a Japanese animation film that I had composed for, so I didn't have any idea that I would be up for a composition award from an American entity. The Boy in the Heron score was also nominated for an Annie and a bunch of other awards, but Hisashi's popularity in the West is about more than just professional recognition. He sells out huge venues in no time at all when he comes to America and Europe, often playing multiple shows in one location just to meet the demand. And he's also got a big online presence now. There's over a million subs on his YouTube channel, and if you're on Japan TikTok, then you'll know that you can't go two minutes without someone slow walking toward a Tory gate to the sound of one of Hisashi's Ghibli scores. What's great is that new generations of fans are discovering his work this way, and the best thing is, there's plenty more to come. When Hisashi was asked about retirement after he finished his work on The Boy and the Heron, he said, Honestly, I think I will compose music to the day I die. I won't retire, ever. I love creating far too much. Does this mean that we're going to get one more collaboration between Hisashi and Miyazaki? While The Boy in the Heron has been touted as Miyazaki's last film, his friend and longtime producer Toshio Suzuki has revealed that he's already thinking about making another one. And Hisashi also believes that he's got at least one more left in the tank. When he was interviewed about working with Miyazaki on The Boy in the Heron, Hisashi said, this is a completely personal opinion of mine, but I don't think it's his final film. What do you guys think? Will Miyazaki ever actually retire? And what's your favourite Joe Hisashi score? I'll always have a soft spot for Kiki's Delivery Service, but for me, I don't think he'll ever top Howl's Moving Castle. Merry Go Round of Life is a perfect piece of music from start to finish, and at this point, it's transcended the film it was written for, becoming just as, if not more, famous. That's great to see, because Sasashi deserves to be recognised for the genius that he is. Miyazaki owes him a great deal, and at this point, the Studio Ghibli co-founder is fully aware that their relationship is something truly special. <laughs> 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 